So, um, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you a brief introduction, just a couple of slides, um, then run through a range of topics. The first is um, running dynamic SQL as static. Uh, then we'll move on to some bind options and programming suggestions. Then the, the, the main part of the session is on um, caching statements, both locally and globally, and on, then on to the new DB212 dynamics plan stability feature that was added recently. Uh, and then we'll do a summary at the end. So um, dynamic SQL was very rarely used in early releases of DB2. Um, I've been using DB2 since 1989. Um, feels like longer than that. Um, but when I started to use it, it was version 1.3, and most sites virtually banned the use of dynamic SQL in DB2 applications. Um, I think Gareth or Julian mentioned it this morning that people weren't tending to use DB2 as a transactional database then. It was more for uh, query applications. There were two primary concerns that most people had. The first was that prepares are relatively expensive, and that's got worse over the years, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but probably the primary one was a lack of control over access paths. With static SQL, you code your SQL, you do the bind or an explain, you can see what the access paths are, if something's wrong, you can see it up front. And you can do something about it before the application goes live. The other thing you can do with static SQL is you've got a guaranteed performance. And that's sometimes actually more important than good performance, is to have an application with the same performance all the time. It's consistent performance characteristics. And you didn't used to get that with dynamic SQL. The statistics changed, and the access path changed the next time you ran a prepare and sometimes you got good SQL and sometimes you didn't. If you're in a data sharing environment and you had two machines of very different size characteristics, which system that package got bound on could have a huge impact on performance. So there's all sorts of reasons why dynamic SQL was not used very frequently. Um, most applications back in those days were static and they were written in PO1 or COBOL. Now the world has changed a huge amount in that time. So, there's lots of reasons why it's changed. One of the first ones was the increased use of third-party applications. Back in the 80s and 90s, almost everybody was using homegrown applications, and they could write their own programs and they knew what was happening. But now, increasingly, and it's not just SAP, but people are using third-party applications, package applications they're buying in uh, and using those, and they've got no control over the access paths. Um, there's also a lot more use of distributed DB2. Distributed DB2 didn't even exist in DB2 version 1. Um, so there's a lot more use of distributed DB2, and especially on ODBC and JDBC, which are inherently dynamic in nature. You've also got the growth of Java and similar languages. Most of the modern languages that are used in DB2 applications these days are also inherently Java, um, uh, dynamic in nature. We'll talk a bit about what we can do to make Java look like a static application later. And this is probably something that's popped up in the last five or 10 years, is the demand for application portability. People want to write applications and they want to know that they can port those applications very easily to another platform or to another database. Now obviously, in a DB2 for ZOS world, We'd all like to prefer people to use ZOS, but we can gain by portability as well by taking Oracle or SQL Server applications and running them on the mainframe. And to do that, we really need to be able to manage dynamic SQL um, because static SQL is largely a characteristic of DB2 for ZOS. So if I go, I travel around quite a lot to different customers and I see significant use of dynamic SQL now, and it's quite common to see sites where the majority of SQL coming into the DB2 app database is dynamic in nature. Is, could anybody back that up? Has anybody got that characteristic now? Now, well, obviously, we've got a history of legacy applications which are static, but I would say the majority of new applications coming in are dynamic in nature. Okay. So if you want to improve dynamic SQL performance, um, actually tuning an individual statement doesn't change. All right. The statement's going to run exactly the same whether it's static or dynamic. There's no magic switch to say 
um, in the optimizer to say I'm using a different access path because it's static and dynamic. So you've still got to tune the SQL statement in exactly the same way whether you're static or dynamic. So we're looking at other things. The first thing is to reduce or eliminate the prepare time. And there are several things we can do here and we'll cover these in turn during a session. The first is can you run the dynamic SQL as if it's static? Um, sometimes that's a good idea, sometimes that's not a, not a good idea, but we'll talk about the options as going through. The caching statements, which is the first of the two major topics going through, is all about reusing access paths so that you gain some control over access path use. And that's also eliminating the prepare time. If you reuse an access path, you're not going through the optimizer the second time, and you're saving yourself a chunk of CPU. Now, that could be 500 microseconds of CPU for an optimization. And if you start doing that enough times, it starts costing some real CPU time. There's obviously good things you can do from a um, good practice in programming terms, such as deferring prepares for distributed requests. Um, luckily, some of those are automatic, but we've got a couple of slides covering those things going through. The second thing you can do is to gain some control over the access path being used. So this is the, probably the main problem that people used to have issues to do, with, to do with using dynamic SQL. So once you've addressed um, handling the prepare time, and even up until DB212, you had very little control over what the access path from a dynamic SQL statement was. So the main option used to be to convert the dynamic SQL to static, which, as I said, we'll cover. Um, DB2, IBM added optimization hints in version 6, um, and the original version of optimization hints, if you were doing a dynamic program, you had to set the optimization hint in the SQL, in your application code. So you had to actually make a coding change to use an optimization hint. Um, now, IBM changed that in DB210 when they added statement level hints, and that avoids the requirement to set a special register. So you can set an optimization hint in DB2 that will be used whenever that SQL statement is executed within DB2. And we've got a couple of slides on that during the session. And then I've got a separate presentation I can share with anybody who's interested in more detail on that later. And then the new feature, DB212, is the beginning of adding control over dynamic access paths to DB2 with this dynamic plan stability feature. It's not the finished article. I'm sure there's more things to come. Um, but it shows a lot of promise, and so we'll cover that at the end in the last four or five slides of the presentation. Right. Now, obviously, I said earlier, you know, you've still got to control um, the, the SQL statement and tune the SQL statement, write it properly, and provide all the right indexes and things. And you've got to give the optimization as much information as possible. So none of this is taking away from the need to code good SQL in the first place and to give the optimizer, optimizer the correct information to allow it to, correct, to choose the right access path. One issue with access path hints, which is a perpetual issue with access path hints, is you're telling DB2 what access path to use, and you're telling DB2 that you know more about the access paths than Terry Purcell. And that's quite likely not to be true. All right. And actually what happens, the trouble is that people have, the trouble with these statement level hints is they can easily go stale and because you don't have to set this current optimization hint to use them, you can be using a hint without really even realizing you're doing so. So you can lock in a bad access path with a hint as well. So like everything, it says it depends. You nearly really had to look after what you're doing. So let's start off by um, converting <coughs> dynamic SQL to static. Now, before you even look at this, you have to actually ask yourself why you're running dynamic SQL in the first place. Right? If you've got one of the old 3270 type green screens with 20 fields on it and the customer can type any combination of entries on those fields and you're dynamically building an SQL statement based on the entries that they do, then the SQL statement's going to look completely different every time and you don't really want to be talking about locking that in. But if you're using dynamic SQL because you're running Java or because you're using some other programming language or for some other reason, then that's where you might want to be looking at some of these options. So there are some options. I'm going to start talking about, um, I'm not sure if this is the latest name for it, because IBM keep changing the name for it. 
Um, but the name that I think of is Infosphere Optin Pure Query Runtime. Now, I'm not going to say that every time, so I'm going to talk about Pure Query. All right? There are some third-party equivalents to DB2 Connect. And the one I've personally come across is Shadow Direct, which is now owned by Rocket Software. All right? um, and we'll talk about that, but there may very well be others. That's just one I'm going to use as an example. And the other option is to use SQLJ for Java rather than JDBC. So let's start off with Pure Query. Has anybody tried to use Pure Query? A sea of no hands. OK. So the two ways of using Pure Query. The first way is to code your application with the Pure Query API. All right. Pure Query will generate you a file of SQL statements. And that looks like a DBRM. So you can bind it, optionally explain it, and you understand what the access path is because you can explain the package. And then instead of running Pure Query um, to run dynamically, you configure Pure Query to use your package. And when Pure Query comes across that statement, it will execute the package. So you've ended up, you've started off with a dynamic program and you've ended up with a static one. All right. There's no need to run through the client optimization process, which is on the next slide. Now, that's good for new applications. The bad side, and Karen's going to have to put her fingers in her ears for this one, is you're locking yourself into the Pure Query API because you've coded the Pure Query API in your programs and you've locked yourself permanently into Pure Query. All right. So um, the other thing is if you see an existing application, obviously it's not going to have been written with Pure Query, and we've talked about the need for a lot of third-party applications coming in. So unless that application has been written to handle Pure Query, you're probably not going to be able to use this. Now the other way of using Pure Query is through this thing called the client optimization process. Now I got this diagram from the IBM Knowledge Center. And what you're doing is you're running your JBT application through Pure Query and you set it into capture mode. And what Pure Query does is this Pure Query runtime runs on a distributed PC, typically an x86 box. But what this Pure Query runtime does is it captures your SQL and then passes it through to the JDBC driver so it runs um, dynamically as normal. But Pure Query is capturing the SQL. You've then got the SQL captured. You can configure it, which effectively creates you something similar to a DBRM, which you can bind into a package. And then you turn Pure Query into static execution mode. And if Pure Query comes across a statement that it's prepared and configured, then it executes it statically. OK? So it runs, it supports .NET and, and JDBC. Um, but you're actually having to run in capture mode, and then you have to convert it to the static execution mode. Works very nicely, all right? And it allows you to run dynamic SQL or static. And I'm quite surprised that you don't see more people using it. Okay, all right. The next option is to competitors to DB2 Connect. People tend to think distributed DB2 is automatically DB2 Connect, but there are third-party equivalents. And one of the ones I've come across that I've had a customer use is Shadow Direct. And it used to be Neon Software, then it got bought by Progress, and it's now owned by Rocket. Um, I don't work for any of these vendors, so there's no recommendation involved in this. I'm just telling you it exists. But it operates a very similar process to the pure query process I showed you on this slide, in that you run through Shadow Direct, and Shadow Direct collects the SQL, and then you can configure it into DBRM and run a bind against it. The difference is that that capture process happens on the mainframe. So effectively, by using Shadow Direct, you're not using the DB2 DDF address space. You're Queries are going into a, another TCP IP listener, which is the Shadow Direct address space, and the capture process happens there. All right. Um, there are some, it provides you things like execution frequencies and other metrics, so you can tell which statements have run through your system and decide which ones get bound. 
So you don't have to bind them all. You can only bind the ones that you think execute enough times to make it worthwhile. All right. um, there are other benefits to be had. Um, it provides zip offload capabilities and other benefits as well. All right. um, but again, I'm not recommending this as a method. I'm just including this for completeness sake. But there are third party equivalents to DB2 Connect. The risk with all of these, obviously, is IBM produce a new release of DB2, and you need to make sure that vendor keeps up to date with all the latest features. But I did have one customer probably 10 years ago, and they reckoned that if they turned this off and went to DB2 Connect, their CPU would have increased by 30 to 40 percent. Right. And that's partially because they were getting more zip offload. The next option is to use SQLJ rather than JDBC. And you start with your Java program and you pass it through an SQLJ translator. And it looks very similar to the static SQL process we're used to seeing with PL1 or COBOL. So that SQLJ translator generates you a modified source file which you compile and generate a, a Java class file, but it also generates you a serialized profile which you customize to produce a DBRM, which you can bind into a plan and a package. And now the class file will execute the package, and you've got Java running static SQL. All right. So this is an, this is an ANSI standard, it's an industry standard. Um, J SQLJ is an industry standard. Um, I think IBM were largely involved in, in promoting this to the, to the industry, um, but it is uh, a complete, it's a complete standards followed process. So this is not something that's, that's limited to just IBM, um, but it's there. All right. Now, as I said, none of these things are going to work particularly well if you've got one of these applications which gives people 20 fields to choose from and they can fill any number of those fields with any value that they like and then you build a dynamic SQL statement completely dynamically and that's genuine dynamic SQL. So there's a bunch of programming tips that I'm good. Now I'm not an application programmer. Um, Marcus is so he's probably going to tell me I've made some complete howlers in here. Um, but there are some tips from a programming perspective that's going to give dynamic SQL a better chance. The first is to avoid running execute immediate. If you say execute immediate, then DB2 is going to do a prepare every time you run that statement. So you're going to get that prepare process every time. All right. The other thing is to avoid multiple prepares. Now, it might sound an obvious thing to say, but you can actually get multiple prepares without you even realizing it. The first thing is if you do the describe before your prepare, then DB2 is going to do a prepare during the describe process, and you'll end up going through the optimization process twice. All right. If you code prepare with into, that can do it twice as well. Or if you specify reopt always, which we'll cover on a later slide. If you're coding your programs, put the describe after the open cursor. So you do the open cursor and then the describe afterwards, not the other way around. All right. Now again, I'm not an application programmer. One of my colleagues came up with some of these. So if they're wrong, please tell me afterwards. <laughs> what I am confident of is the next one, is avoiding ambiguous cursors. This is lazy programming. All right. There's a this is mostly for distributed DB2, but there's a really important feature of distributed DB2 called block fetch. So that when you fetch several rows back from a cursor, DB2 passes them back to your application in a block, and you, when you issue the subsequent fetch, it doesn't have to go across the network again. All right. Now, you only get block fetch when DB2 knows that it's not an ambiguous cursor. And what I mean by an ambiguous cursor is a cursor where DB2 doesn't know whether you're going to do a subsequent update or not. So if you say select for fetch only or select for read only, DB2 knows that you're never going to do an update and that enables block fetch. Right. So simply by missing this statement out, you're hitting a performance problem in your application and it's completely avoidable. When you program your, when you code programs 99% of the time, you know whether you're going to do an update or not later on. There are instances where you may not know, but most of the time you do know that you're doing an update. 
tell DB2 as much information as possible and you're giving the optimizer more chance to get the right access path. Don't use withhold unless absolutely necessary. For those of you who are listening to Gareth just now, he was talking about um, sysplex balancing, workload balancing, and one of the things that was avoiding was cursors withhold. So you do a commit and your cursor's still open. But from a pure programming perspective, if you do a commit and the cursor is still open, then when your program closes, DB2 has still got to close the cursor, so it's got to do another network access to close the cursor. So you're incurs incurring an extra, curse, an extra network access just to close the cursor. Right. Now, there, are, there are other things to do with withhold which are bad, like retain locks and all sorts of other things like this. So there's lots of reasons for not doing it. Don't do it unless you have to. And the last tip I've got is to use typed parameter markers. Now, a lot of people don't know what these are, but an untyped example, a parameter marker, is this. And people tend to use this because it allows DB2 to do better caching. And we'll talk about that later. But if you think about the optimizer, it doesn't know, at optimization time, what data type that parameter marker is. All right. So if you code that exact statement as this, assuming that EMPNO is a char 6 column, then the optimizer knows that that is going to be a char 6. And so it just allows DB2 to process that statement more effectively. All right. If you look in the managing performance guide for DB2, it's listed in there. All right. So it's not a secret, but, but most people don't do it. All right. Now, I don't think this is going to make... I'm not saying by starting to code like this, you're going to start getting in, you know, 10% improvement in CPU. You're talking about fractions of percents of CPU. But again, if the statement executes enough time, it starts to add up. The next thing I want to talk about is bind options. Um, the bind option reopt can drive a re-prepare re or a second prepare. And there are a number of options. Um, the default is none, which means that when you do the prepare, that's the access path you get. But you can code always, auto, or once. Now, those have changed at one time. The parameters used to be different, uh, but they're now always, auto, or once. Now, there can be good reasons for doing this. And skewed data is a typical example. If your data is incredibly skewed, it can make a huge difference to the access path as to whether you're using the, the very common host variable or not. Now, obviously, you can improve your chances by collecting the collect statistics to tell that DB2 that the data is skewed. Um, but if you've got incredibly skewed data, I've seen at least one example at a real customer site where they got themselves out of a huge performance hole by using this reopt option because they had incredibly skewed data and DB2 was choosing, you really needed to know which host variable you were using before you decided whether you were going to use the index or not. Right. Now, this is a bit of a long shot, but what if you don't want the SQL ever to be reused? Right. If you don't want the SQL to be reused, or, and you don't want the SQL to be cached, so you want to preserve your cache space, it's possible to use reopt to prevent that, because reopt is one of the things that prevents the SQL statement cache being used. All right. Now, I'm not advocating you do this all the time, but it's just something to be aware of that's worth thinking about. Um, the other thing is to use defer prepare, and that's luckily the default now. And if you do defer prepare, in your program, when you do a prepare and an execute, DB2 doesn't do a network access for the prepare, and it passes these across the network in one access. So you're, again, you're saving a network access in distributed DB2 applications. This is the bind option for the connect package. This is, this is the bind option for a package. Um, this would probably be more for um, um, if, you were, if you're using one of these, um, turning dynamic SQL into static options. Yeah, I mean, I think pure, pure dynamic SQL probably wouldn't, wouldn't do reopt. Still using a package, still using yeah. A connect package. Yeah. I don't think you'd ever want to turn that connect package to to use reopt. I mean, that, that would that would be a, a killer. I think. Um, yeah. I'm probably talking about if you were if you had used one of these convert dynamic SQL into static SQL options, and then you wanted to use the package there. But 
I, I think um, this is this is probably more a static um, option than dynamic. It probably probably ought to not be in the presentation. So let's move on to access path hints. Um, access path hints provide a way to suggest an access path to the optimizer. All right, and suggest is a very important word. It's not a directive. All right, you're telling DB2 the optimizer that you would like an access path to be chosen, but the optimizer reserves the right to ignore you. All right. um, now the old method was introduced back in DB2 version 6 and it's still supported today. All right. And it requires a programming change to use it. And what you do is you, you typically take your plan table with the access path you wish to use um, and that's the reason I'm saying is use the plan table is there's not many people could write a plan table row and get the access path correct because there's a lot of columns in those these days. This is more often if you've got an access path you like and you want it to be reused. So you take your plan table row and you update a column called opt hint with a value and that hint value might be Steve hint. Then you set the current optimization hint special register in your program to Steve hint. And now when DB2 does the prepare, it will try to reuse the access path from the plan table. Okay. The key thing here is for dynamic programs, you have to set this optimization hint special register. Right? For static programs, there is an opt hint keyword in the bind package to allow you to use this. Um, but this is for dynamic programs. Now when you run the prepare, you get an SQL plus 394 if the hint has been reused. And you get an SQL code plus 395 if it hasn't been used. And you get one of, you get up to 50 possible reasons. DB2 is very good and it tells you why, you, why it hasn't used your hint. The most common is that you've asked it to use an index and either the index doesn't exist or it's in a restricted state. But there are a whole bunch of other ones as well. And I think if, um, I'm not exactly sure why, but the optimizer has, there's a 50 options. So there's a huge number of these. All right. So this has been around for a long time. I think version six was 1999 or something like that. So it's been around for getting on for 20 years now. Now in DB2.10, IBM added a second way to do access path hints called statement level hints. And what you do is there's, you've still got your plan table with the hint you want to use, but in this case, you don't specify the opt hint column. So I don't put Steve hint in my column. What I do is I look at a second plan table rows, one of the 24 or 27 plan table rows there are, one of the other tables is called DSN user query table and that query that table includes the query text but it also includes the hint scope and some other information all right so you've got the plan table and you've got the DSN user query table and then what you do is you issue this new command called bind query lookup no and what that does is it looks at your plan table and it looks at the DSN user query table and it populates data into a repository in the catalog, which is a new DB2 catalog table. And now when you do your prepare, you don't have to specify the opt hint keyword anywhere. DB2 will look at the catalog tables and if it comes across the statement in the table, it will try and use the access path that's been stored in the catalog. Okay, you get the same plus 394 and 395 reason codes. Um, you don't need a special register to set it. Okay. There are some gotchas to do with this. All right. The first gotcha is that the plan table table <coughs> needs a specific index on some specific columns for either of the hint methods to work. And if that index is not there, it won't work. And it's one of the most common reasons why people try and use access path hints and they don't work. Now, if you want the DDL, you can either use the store procedure that Dennis was talking about earlier to create your pl plan table tables, 
Or if you look in the DSN sample table at DSN-TESC, that's got the DDL for the plan table, but it's also got the DDL for this index. For statement level hints, the SQL text and the object names have to be in uppercase. That's not always the case if you've got SQL coming from a distributed system. At the moment, one downside of it is there's no support for functions, triggers, or SQL procedures, and that hasn't changed in DB2.11 or in DB2.12. One thing you need to be very careful of is this command looks at plan table and the matching rows in DSN user query table and loads the whole lot into the catalog. All right. now, if you're not very careful and you use that command against the wrong plan table, if that plan table had a history of all your explains for the last five years in it, you could potentially load thousands of rows into the catalog. All right. So you really need to have a specific plan table and DSN user query table to use these. And it's a good idea to have a completely separate plan table. And when you issue that command, you only use the plan table with those couple of statements in it that you want loaded into the catalog. All right. And then, if necessary, save those values off to a, an archive table afterwards. Do not run that um, bind query lookup no command against your general purpose plan table. Otherwise, you'll probably find yourself loading unwanted access path hints into the catalog. Okay? And the other thing to remember is that hints can become stale. Now, it's not so bad for the old type of hints because you had to set this special register. But this one, the statement level hints, there's no need to set the special register. And you can have a statement coming in and being using a hint, and you're wondering why on earth is DB2 using this access path, and it's because you've told it three years ago and have forgotten to clean out the catalog. All right. So if you're interested in statement level hints, I've got an IDUG presentation specifically on it, a full presentation. Send me an email, um, steve.thomas at ca.com, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of it. Exactly. 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 So when you do that, you're going to use. <coughs> yeah. Um, it, we'll talk about match, we'll talk about statement matching in the dynamic statement cache later on, and it's very much the same. All right. Now there are some slight differences in this. the The recommendation is to use the SQL statement that's that's come out of the optimizer. Um, so you use the internal representation of the statement from syspack statement or, or sysplan statement if you're on an older release. So that, but there are some, there, it's very sensitive to SQL statements being different. So, um, you know, it's, it's very much like the statement cache. All right. Um, the other thing I'd say about um, statement level hints of, on either statement level hints or the old way of hints is if you want to try them, Find a test system and try them now. All right? Don't wait till you need to use them before you try and use it for the first time because, uh, trust me, you will not get it right. All right. It can take several hours before you can get one of these things to work. All right? There are some, all sorts of strange things happen with them unless, you, unless you're very careful. So be aware of what these things look like. Make, there's, there's, when these statement level hints came out, there's not just my presentation, there's three or four presentations available from iDoug and other people. Uh, make sure that you know how they work. Because you can lock in a bad access path. <clears throat> now, the, the real game changer for um, dynamic execution was caching. This was introduced back in version 5 in 1997, so it's been available for 20 years now. But, but before this, dynamic SQL was virtually unheard of, and afterwards it's become much more common. The idea is to save an access path and reuse it for dynamic SQL. What you do is you avoid the full prepare and most of the additional costs. Now, there are two types of cache in DB2 for ZOS, the local and the global cache. Right. And DB2.12 improves caching further 
with the dynamic plan stability feature, which we'll talk about later. But it's important to bear in mind that dynamic plan stability requires you to be using caching. All right. You can't get dynamic plan stability without caching. So let's talk about this first. Now there are two types of cache. The first type of cache is associated, it's the local cache, and it's associated with thread storage in the DBM1 address space. It's enabled by this keep dynamic bind option. And you end up with it, there's a ZPUM that controls how many statements can be stored. Now, what this local cache does is it avoids the need for a prepare, but your program has to be aware of to do that. So if you're using local caching on its own and you issue a prepare and you issue a commit, your program has to know that you've got caching on with local caching on and avoid the need to do a prepare the second time. If you code the prepare in your program and you execute it, DB2 is going to execute that prepare. All right. So local caching on its own is quite difficult to use. You have to make programming changes to use it properly, um, and it's not particularly useful. The thing that was added in 1997 is global dynamic statement caching. All right. Now that's enabled by a ZPUM called cachedyne equals yes. It's completely transparent to the program. All right. And it enables what's called a short prepare. And we'll talk about the difference between full and short prepares on the next slide. Now, you've got local caching and global caching. And if you've got both of them active, you've got what's called full caching. Okay. Now, I personally don't see that many people using local caching. Do you, Karen? No. So this one's quite uncommon. This is, this is the one that saves you all the money. And I'll explain why on this slide. Full, cost, full optimization is an expensive process. All right? And every release of DB2, the optimizer gets more sophisticated, allows more choices of access paths, and inevitably, the code that the optimizer has to go through to make that decision gets bigger. All right? So let's say a full prepare is 100 units, and I'm not going to say what the units are, but it could be 500 microseconds or more, depending on what you're doing and how many predicates you've got. But it's a significantly expensive process. If you get a hit in a global dynamic statement cache, DB2 copies the access path from the global dynamic statement cache into the EDM pool and uses that. And that is called a short prepare. DB2 doesn't have to go through the optimization process. It's just copying the access path from the cache into the EDM pool. And that's called a short prepare, and it costs relatively one unit. So it's 99% cheaper. And that's where all the savings come from. All right. Now, if you've got a dynamic statement cache and you've got full caching involved, you've got local and global caching both active, then you can avoid a prepare completely. But that's going to only go from one unit to naught. So you've got 99% of the savings are by turning on global caching, and you really get a very small saving for possibly quite a large amount of memory by using local caching as well. And that's why this, this global statement caching is the, is, is the big deal, and that's why it was the big saving. Now, if you want to use, this comes back to Mark's question, if your statement needs to use a cache, it's got to be 100% identical to get cache reuse. All right? And that includes things like trailing blanks. All right? It certainly includes things like blanks between the from and the table, embedded blanks in a statement. And it also includes literals. You've also got to have pretty much everything else has got to be identical as well. So all the special registers, all the cursor characteristics, all the parser options, the authorization IDs is probably the big gotcha. Right. If you're passing the auth ID through DB2, then if 100 people execute the same statement, you're going to have 100 entries in the, in the cache. All right. All right. Even whether the resource limit facility disables parallelism or not, that has to be the same. They have to be identical. 
Now, some things like DSN TET2 can strip trailing blanks, but that's a marginal saving. Effectively, the statements have to be identical. Now, the biggest item in that list is, is literals. So if you've got a, a dynamic program and it's genuinely dynamic, you've probably got a statement where customer is A and another one where customer equals B, and DB2 are gonna, is going to consider those as different statements, and they'll both get stored in the cache separately. This is where literals or parameter markers come in useful. If you use parameter markers in your program, then you're enabling the statement to be cached into the cache once. Now, to do that, um, if you do a prepare statement, there's a, a keyword that says concentrate statements on literals. And what DB2 is going to do is even if your program is coded with this, it's going to replace them with, with parameter markers and put them into the cache once. New in DB2.12, and it was added in DB2.12 and there's not a big fanfare about it, is there's a new bind package option called concentrate statement. So you can now get statement concentration from a bind option at the package level. If you're using ODBC, in the initialization file, there's a keyword called literal replacement. And if you're using a JCC driver, it says enable literal replacement equals yes to get it. And if you do that, what DB2 is, it's going to replace the literals with an ampersand and it also usefully strips any trailing blanks if that's the only difference in the access path. And that allows you to get much better cache reuse. All right. So um, I know um, that at least some of you in this room are using SAP. And SAP are massive users of the dynamic statement cache. And I think a lot of the changes that IBM have done to the statement caching over the years have been done to support SAP. If you've got statements in a statement cache and you want to explain them, you have to have these if kids running. All right. So it's performance class 30, if kids 316, 317, and 318. Um, 316 contains the first 60 bytes of the SQL and the execution statistics. So how many times the statement's executed. 317 is the full SQL statement, if you need that. And 318 enables the collection of statistics in the cache. So to get things like execution statistics at all, you have to have 318 on. All right. So what you do is you start the trace, and then you run your workload that you want to analyze. And then once the workload's done, you use one of these two options. All right. You either say, explain statement cache all. And what DB2 is going to do is it's going to dump the data from the statement cache into this DSN statement cache table, which is one of the plan table tables. And then from there, you have to explain it. So DB2, this statement doesn't do the explain. It just dumps the statements from the cache into this DSN statement cache table. Now, you only get the statements you're, enabled, you're authorized to use. So if you want to use them all, you have to do it with a sysadm. Right. <coughs> um, and you also get things like execution counts, uh, the CPU usage, get pages, and other useful things. Right. Now, if you happen to know the statement ID or the statement token of an individual statement in the cache, you can explain it from the cache directly with this explain, explain statement cache statement ID option, and that will actually populate all the plan tables for you. I've got the gotcha with that. Um, if you're running data sharing, you have to run explain statement cache per member, because each member has its own statement cache. Thank you. So Marcus's comment for those listening to the video is there's a gotcha here, is if you're running data sharing, you have to run that command, the first one, the first one on each member gear, because the statement cache is stored per member. If you want to clear statements from the cache, there are reasons why you might want to clear statements from the cache. Um, one of the reasons is you might have an index gone into a restricted state. And if the statement cache is trying to use that index, DB2 is going to fall back from that index to a, statement, to a table space scan. So there are various reasons why you might want to clear statements from the cache. Another good thing is if you're analyzing a workload and you want to have a clean cache so that when you dump the cache, you've got the execution statistics, you might want to clean the cache out. Now, there are various ways of doing it. Um, you, you can do it with reorg 
um, or inline statistics collection um, will clear the cache. But obviously, you don't want to have to run a real just to clear the cache. So in DB2.11 and earlier, you had to use run stats update none so that there was no catalog statistics getting updated in the catalog and report no. So basically, you were running run stats with telling it not to do anything. Um, what's happened in DB2.12 is there's a new keyword gone in now specifically for run stats saying invalidate cache. All right. So you can now tell run stats whether to invalidate the cache or not. And I think the default is that it doesn't invalidate the cache, I believe, but you'd have to check that. And finally, we've got 15 minutes left, or 10 to 15 minutes left, we'll talk about dynamic plan stability. So one issue, the, the last issue with dynamic SQL was gaining some sort of control over it. All right. um, you run dynamic SQL, and you've got an access path, and DB2 might be caching it, but it's very difficult to explain it in advance. So you don't know what the access path is. It's very difficult to explain a statement within a program. Now, that has been improved recently. If you listen to Dennis's presentation from earlier today, he was talking about um, a um, stored procedure where you can run and explain. So you could, in theory, um, invoke a stored procedure within a program and explain it that way. But that would be quite convoluted and have to be in every program. All right. Now, IBM have improved things for some time since about DB2 7 or 8 now um, with the static STL plan stability. So that gave you plan stability options where you could try and reuse the same access path if you did a rebind. All right. You have AP reuse and AP compare, and there are various options being added, and that's been improved in every release for the last two or three releases. But that never be, was able to use it for dynamic SQL. So what you get is the beginnings of the features of plan stability in dynamic SQL. It's not the final version yet. We haven't got things like AP reuse and AP compare, but this is the first stages, and you can see that IBM are likely to extend this going forward. So what it does is it stores dynamic SQL access paths from the dynamic statement cache and saves them in the catalog. All right. And then if you're using statement caching and DB2 has a statement level miss, the first thing it does is it checks in the catalog to see if that statement is stored in the catalog. And if it's stored in the catalog, it populates the statement cache from the catalog. All right. So what you're doing is locking dynamic SQL access paths in the catalog, and then DB2 is adding an extra check in the catalog if it does a statement level miss. All right. So it promises more stable and predictable performance. It also means that if you've got a, uh, a fairly um, controllable application and you have to do something like shutting down DB2, when you bring DB2 back up, you haven't got the blizzard of prepares that you used to get because now DB2 is going to load most of the data from the catalog back into the statement cache rather than issuing all these prepare statements. So there's a huge amount of benefit to be had. All right. What you haven't got today is the ability to rebind the access paths that are in here. They're locked in. All right. So if you want to do a rebind, you're going to have to clear the catalog out and repopulate it. All right. So you can see that there's some, there's some features that you can see that that's likely to be improved at some point in the future. So there's no AP reuse, there's no AP compare capability. But what there is, is the capability to lock statements from the dynamic statement cache into the catalog and then reuse them. Now, to support this, there are a whole bunch of catalog tables. There's a new catalog table called sysdyne query, which contains the SQL text. Um, there's sysdyne query dependencies, which is dependencies on objects that are not obvious. So things like um, dependencies on UDFs and stored procedures will be stored in there. And the reason for doing that is if you make a change to this UDF or stored procedure, DB2 needs to disable that statement in a catalog so that you're not reloading it. 
And then there are five more cystine tables with various names after them that store the internals of the access path and other information. All right. There are a number of additional columns being added to the statement cache table. And these are some of the statement columns. The query hash, the query ID, whether it's been stabilized or not, and the stabilization group. All right. We'll talk about stabilization group in a second. All right. And when DB2 loads data from the catalog back into the dynamic statement cache, it populates stabilized per statement ID in the stabilization group. So it populates that data from the, from the catalog. So that data is populated into the catalog and it's updated here. So the query hash is the key thing here. That's how DB2 identifies the statement. So it's doing a hash on the query and identifying. That's why the query has to be identical. Now, the other thing that's useful is in sysdyncary, there's a column called last used. Now, that's updated once a day or on DB2 shutdown, and it will tell you when that stabilized statement that's in the catalog has last been used. So if you see statements in there that are quite old and they've never been reused, it may be that you've, there may be a good reason for it to be in there, but at least it gives you some help to control what data is in the catalog. So how does it work? There's yet another command to populate the catalog from the dynamic statement cache, and it's called start dying query capture. Now you can do it on demand, or you can set DB2 up to do ongoing monitoring of the dynamic statement cache and to populate the catalog from the dynamic statement cache on an ongoing basis. And I've got an example of what the command looks like on a later slide. So what this command does is it captures data from a dynamic statement cache and populates the catalog. And once you've done that, DB2 will check the catalog if it has a dynamic statement cache miss, and if the statement's found in there, it will populate it into the dynamic statement cache for you. So this is what the statement looks like. So you say, start dying query capture and stabilization group with a, with a name. And there's no, the only reason that stabilization group is there is you can basically link together all the statements that you've loaded in with this execution of this command. So I could say, did start dying query, stabilization group, Steve's statements. And then if I wanted to free them out of the catalog, I could free them using that stabilization group. You give it a threshold which by default is two, but you can give it any number you want. And then you can, if you want to load a specific statement, you can say statement ID or statement token. And if you give it this cache snap spec, it's got things like um, which SQL ID data you're loading in, whether you want to monitor it, yes or no. And if you say monitor, yes, you're setting up this persistent monitoring. And also whether you want the scope to be an individual DB2 member or the data sharing group. So the threshold needs if kids 318 to be on so that you've got the statistics in the dynamic statement cache. So you could say start dying query capture threshold 10 and you're saying if a statement is in a dynamic statement cache and it's used 10 times, it will be populated into the catalog. And the monitor is what sets up the continuous monitoring. Now, there's um, a DB2 performance red book that's just come out um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a chapter on this. Um, I haven't looked at what the overhead of the monitoring is. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the full book yet, but I would, if you're interested in this, I would recommend you look at the Red Book. There's almost certainly a, a chapter on this in the Red Book. So this whole process is enabled by a new ZPALM, inevitably, Cash Dine Stabilization. And you can set this ZPALM to both capture, load, or none. Now, if you set it to none, it's turned off. If you set it to capture, you've asked DB2 to capture data from the dynamic statement cache and load it into the table, into the catalog table, but you haven't turned on dynamic plan stability because DB2 is not going to populate the dynamic statement cache from the catalog. It's a one-way process. 
You can also set it to load, where DB2 will load data from the catalog into the dynamic statement cache, or you can have it doing both ways. Stabilized statements are not refreshed by a new capture request. Okay? So if you have an access path locked into the catalog, and it's in the catalog, and it's active, then it's not going to be refreshed by a new request. All right. if, the, if the statement has been deactivated for some reason, for example, you've done some DDL on a table, and DB2 has disabled the statements in the dynamic statement inquiry, then I think it does refresh it. But I don't think it doesn't refresh statements in the, in the catalog if they're active. All right. They might be invalidated by things like dropping index. Um, and uh, this is what I just said. You don't get stabilization group again until you've done that. So once, once statements get deactivated or invalidated in the catalog, uh, they're left in the catalog they're not deleted from the catalog, they're still there, but they're marked as being um, invalid. Now you can manually free them with this free stabilized dynamic query command. And this is where the stabilization group, so I might say Steve statements in here, and there are various other options to say which statements you want removed from the catalog. All right. And there's other options in here that you can say I only want to free the invalid ones. So then it would free up the invalid statements, but leave the valid ones still in the catalog. Now, to me, this looks like a real benefit to DB2. I can see this being a massive improvement moving forward. I think it was one of the more popular features in the early support program, is my understanding, for those customers using Dynamic SQL. But you can also see it's not the finished article. All right. We haven't got all the capabilities of static plan stability yet. Um, one of the key things I can see, obviously, is the inability to be able to rebind the statements in here. All right. There are some restrictions. Um, it only supports loading data from the dynamic statement cache. Um, so you can't do a bind straight from a, uh, a program in, into, this, into this thing. You've got to go, you, the, the statement has got to be executed and stored in the statement cache. Um, there's no statement concentration. There's no support for temporal or transparent archiving data. Um, if you use reopt, um, they're excluded, and there's no rebind support. So these are these are a list of some of the features that are in this in this new feature that I can see some of them being removed. I can see one of the first ones being this. Right, but again, I don't work for IBM. I can't tell you what IBM are going to do next. But if I was Terry Purcell and I was in charge of it, then that's one of the first things I'd be doing. Right. So that's me done, pretty much on time. Thank you very much for listening. Um, it's session IK. If you can fill out your evaluation forms, and then I think there's a closing session yeah, in, the in the main room. So, the and has anybody got any questions? Or have I blinded everybody with science? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks,